Well, welcome back to our Read Through the Bible. Today we're picking up in the 55th Psalm. But before we jump into Psalm number 55, let's just kind of review a little bit about what the Psalms are all about. Now, of course, there are 150 Psalms, and the Psalms were written primarily for the purpose to express and enhance worship. In fact, as you remember, we have said that the Psalms are Israel's hymnal, ancient Israel's hymnal. And remember, the 150 of the 150, 73 were written by David or ascribed to him. There could have been more, but 73 that we know of that were written by him. 12 we know were written by Asaph, who was one of the Levitical singers. And 10 by the sons of Korah, who kind of come out of that same group. Um, Korah goes back, of course, to the, the rebellion of Korah in the wilderness. Fascinating connection there, but we won't spend much time talking about that. Two are, are attributed directly to Solomon, one each to Moses, Haman, and Ethan. But there are 50 that are anonymous. We don't know who wrote them, so um, those authors that we just mentioned could have written more than the 73, 12, 10, 2, 1, 1, 1 that, that are ascribed to those authors. Um, but again, they are designed to be utilized in worship and expression of praise to God. And some of them are fascinatingly uh, describing the accompaniment, like this will be used with the five-string lyre, the eight-string lyre. Some of them are ascribed to particular uh, Levitical song leaders. So some pretty specific instructions for worship given in the Psalms, in addition, obviously, to the meaning and the preaching that can come from each Psalm. So let's jump into Psalm 55, having given that little background. Um, Psalm 55 is for the choir director. Again, instructions given. On string instruments. A mascal. Uh, we don't know exactly what a mascal means. It perhaps meant instruction, meditation, kind of like Salah, meditate on this. Uh, a teaching or a meditation. But this particular psalm is a prayer for the defeat of David's treacherous enemy, enemies. The first five verses, hear my prayer, uh, my wicked enemy, uh, is against me, horror has overwhelmed me. You know, David expresses deep meaning. And some people will even say that David, you know, kind of has some depressive tendencies as you read through some of his writings. You know, again here, uh, my enemy is overwhelming me. Uh, verse 6 of Psalm 55 is a very famous verse. This verse has been used in many funerals over the years. Very famous verse. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, that I would fly away and be at rest. So David is Thing here, if I could just get away from my enemies, things would be okay. Have you ever had the thought that if I could escape the particular problem that I'm facing now in life, things would be better? Well, you're not alone. Uh, verses 12 through 14, he seems to be des describing an enemy who has betrayed him. He refers to him as my equal, my familiar friend, the one that I had fellowship with in the past. Um, he may be in referencing actually his son, Absalom that rebelled against him or Absalom's counselor and the one that became a traitor, the counselor that became a traitor to David, Ahithophel. But all that goes back to, um, uh, kind of Ahithophel does, to David's sin with Bathsheba. Remember, our sins will find us out. Um, and then in verse 19, David describes enemies with the one in whom there is no change and no no repentance. They don't change. So, so David recognizes that... Uh, they don't change, they don't repent, they do not fear God. But he closes in the 23rd verse of Psalm 55, I will trust in you. And then we jump into Psalm 56. Um, again, like so many of David's psalms, uh, designed to be utilized in music, but also expressing kind of probably the time when David is running from Saul. Remember the time that he went to Gath to uh, Achish, the Philistine king down there, so he's afraid of both of Saul and the Philistines. You know, David is in a, in a jam, a bad situation here. Um, so he goes on to, to begin to write here, uh, you know, God only is faithful in, in verse 2. My foes have trampled me all day long. You can imagine how David might have felt, felt both his nation, the national king, Saul, is against him, and now he's kind of gone down to the Philistines and he has to hide things from them. So you can imagine how he might feel here. Uh, verse 3, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. There's always this refrain in David, I'm being overwhelmed, but yet I will trust in you, and ultimately you will deliver me. Um, verse 8, David says that, that I'm in distress. Um, uh, put my tears in a bottle. Um, again, you can kind of see this kind of depressive nature, but David is, you know, I want my, my tears kind of recorded. I can put them in a bottle. Um, verse 13, you've delivered me from death. 
I will walk before you in the land of the living. A reference to eternal life in, in, in David's writings in these Psalms. Fascinating. Well, this brings us to Psalm 57. Uh, again, this is written when David is running from Saul. I mean, it's kind of a common refrain. You know, poor old David, he had a, had a really rough life. He, he is the greatest king of, of Israel outside of the king of kings and lord of lords, Jesus Christ, obviously. But Psalm 57 is written while David is fleeing from Saul, hiding in a, in a cave, um, either the cave of Adullam, um, described in 1 Samuel 22, or perhaps the cave of En Gedi, described in 1 Samuel 24. So, uh, And you kind of get this uh, as you read this in, in verse 1. In the shadow of the wings, I will take refuge. Uh, that may be a reference to cherubim. Remember the cherubim, how they had the outstretched wings over the mercy seat was the meeting place of God. And he says, in God's presence, I will take refuge. Even in, in this dark cave, I will take refuge in God. In the shadow of the wings, the cherubim guarding the presence of the access of God. In the shadow of their wings, I will take refuge. In God's presence, I will take refuge. He's writing. My soul is among the lions. They have prepared a net for me. Uh, they've dug a pit to catch me. But yet, in all of this, he praises God for God's ultimate deliverance. And then Psalm 58, um, again, used in the worship of God. The first five verses, uh, David charges the wicked judges and rulers. Uh, they work on righteousness, verse 2. They're like lions, verse 3. Uh, they spew venom constantly, verse 4. And then in verse this is 6 for 11 through 11, he changes to this imprecatory um, prayer. Remember, uh, an imprecatory prayer would be a prayer for the destruction and judgment of my enemies. Um, judge them. Destroy them. Uh, verse 6, shatter their teeth. Um, verse 8, this is very poetic and very visual. Let them melt like a snail in the sun. Have you ever seen a, you know, a snail or a slug in the hot sun? David says, let them melt like this. Uh, sweep them away. And in verse 10, the righteous will rejoice when he sees your vengeance. You know, very imprecatory. He's praying for the destruction of his enemies, but it kind of also reminds us that vengeance must be God's. We must not take vengeance in our own hands. And David is, is praying this. You know, he had a couple of times that he could have actually um, uh, killed Saul, and he didn't. Um, so he understood this, but he is praying for God's vengeance. So that's the way we should approach this. The whole question about how much we should actually pray in precatory prayers, but you know, here you have an example. Uh, Psalm 59. This is written when David, again, you know, and they're, they're not necessarily in chronological order, clearly, but David, again, is running uh, from Saul. And this is the time when, remember, David had married one of Saul's daughters, Michael, and there's a long history of that that we obviously won't get into right now. But um, uh, so David's wife, Michael, who was also Saul's daughter, helps David escape from men that Saul sent to kill him at a certain time. And so here he is writing the psalm, probably in reference to that event. Uh, Save me from men of bloodshed, he writes. Um, for no guilt of mine, I haven't done anything wrong, God, in verse 4. Verse 5, uh, do not be gracious to any who are treacherous. You know, give your grace to those that are righteous. And he's praying within the character of God here. Verses 7 and 8, they say who hears. No one hears us. No one knows. And... Um, so they say, we'll be able to get away with this. But, of course, they won't. Because um, he writes in verse 8, you laugh at them. It kind of reminds us of the first psalm, that he who sits in the heavens laughs, for he will have them in derision. And in verse 13, as this psalm comes to an end, destroy them, so everyone will know who rules, that you, God, rule in Jacob. But as for me, I will sing of your strength. Again, worship. I will sing of your strength. I will praise your name. Uh, psalm 60 is a national prayer. Um, it's kind of when they're, they're facing this national disaster, actually. Um, and so you can see this, this would have been a, a psalm of great praise for national deliverance. A national prayer against Aram and Assyria in the north and the Edomites in the south and, and, and the Moabites are involved in this. So they're, they're being kind of attacked on every side. And um, something apparently has gone really wrong. And so he expresses a prayer to God for deliverance and a praise for that deliverance at the same time. In the first four verses, he expresses fear and dismay at whatever it was, the apparent setback that they had endured. It doesn't really tell us specifically. 
Verse 1, you have been angry. Restore us. Again, you know, kind of the thing there. Your judgment is upon us for a reason, so restore us. Bring us back. Uh, verse 3, you made your people experience hardship. Uh, verse 5 begins this prayer for deliverance. Um, save with your right hand and answer us. Verses 6 and 7, God will save Israel. So, you know, he's seeing this setback, seeing that Israel has fallen a difficult place, but at the same time, this prayer for deliverance. Um, and in verse 8, the enemies, Moab, Edom, Philistia, three enemies that surround Israel to each side. You know, God says, deliver us, defeat them. It doesn't mention the Arameans here, but the Arameans are involved. This, this is his general prayer. These ancient historical enemies of Israel, Moab, Edom, Philistia, on the, the right side, on the left side, you know, kind of encompassing around them, deliver us from them. We're surrounded by enemies. Verse 12, God will defeat our adversaries. And, and he did. This probably goes back to the event again in 2 Samuel 8 when there was a great deliverance of God from the Arameans, the Edomites, the Moabites, and, and perhaps even the Philistines were involved in that. Well, Psalm 61, uh, settings unsure, perhaps the time that Absalom drove David from the throne and forced him to leave Jerusalem. Uh, the first couple of verses, hear my prayer, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Uh, God's strength is above my strength. You will prolong the king's life in verse 6. You're going to take care of your anointed. It's kind of uh, some messianic references here too, not only to the, to the temporal king David, but to the eternal king, Jesus Christ, the king of kings and lord of lords. Uh, verse 7, he will abide before God forever. Now that, that's definitely messianic covenant, that there will, will never fail to be a man to sit on the throne of Israel. The, the Davidic covenant, the Messiah, will reign forever and ever. I will sing praises to your name forever, verse 8, and worship. Now, that's an eternal reference, you know, that we will praise God forever, that this life is not all there is. And you can see how beautiful this worship is, that, that God is going to, to be there forever, and that these times of trouble are temporary, but there is this faith in God. And, and we need to learn this, that in difficult in, in times, in times of distress, we need to put our faith in an eternal God. Well, David certainly does this. Um, Psalm 62, um, this is a good example of a psalm that gives a specific title uh, to a specific worship leader. Uh, for the choir director, the Levitical choir director, a man named Judathon, a temple musician, uh, David again is focusing on a hard time, perhaps a time of treason, perhaps again the time when Absalom had run him out. This seems to be a time when he, he really didn't probably write a lot of of, of Psalms through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Remember, all this comes from God's Spirit. Uh, God only is my rock and my salvation. I shall not be greatly shaken. Verse 3, uh, my attacker will be judged. Verse 4, they are two-faced. Now, doesn't that sound like Absalom? If I was king, things would be better as he tries to usurp the power of David and actually does, you know, become successful in that for a period of time. Verse 5, my soul waits in silence for God. My hope is from him. It kind of reminds us of, um, does it not, um, Isaiah? Those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. Verse 11, power belongs to God. Verse 12, you recompense a man according to his work. And kind of that scene where David left the Ark of the Covenant, did not take it when he left Jerusalem, and he said, if I am faithful, God will bring him back. Read that. That's a great story. And that will bring us to the last psalm we're going to deal with today, Psalm 63. Kind of reminds us of the 42nd psalm as David is expressing deep thirst for God. You know that, that story? As the deer pants after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O oh God. Kind of the same thing here. Um, it expresses David's deep thirst for God. He's in the Judean wilderness um, at a very low point again, probably running from, from Saul, maybe Absalom. And, you know, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you because of your loving kindness. I will praise your name. Your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. Uh, verse 6, I think of you all night, you know, kind of as he's in this, this, this press situation. David had some depressive tendencies, no doubt about it, and he had reasons to. My soul clings to you in the last couple of verses. You will rescue me, so I will praise you. Isn't that beautiful? Read God's Bible and you will get a blessing. May God bless the reading of his word.